He's a general manager for City TV and City FM. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much, Vivian. Please put your hands together for Vivian Kai Loco. So, I'm not getting any joy from the audience at all, and I don't know why. I don't know whether some of you, your money has been stuck, but by the end of this program, you will know that your money is safe. Tell somebody your money is safe. <laughs> So, uh, we're live on CTFM, CTTV. Um, <clears throat> in many spaces globally, when crisis occurs, you rarely have real-time conversations about the crisis. So, you can read a lot of reflective material on what happened. And it's very easy to write looking back because uh, hindsight is 2020. So, we are very lucky in Ghana that we are people who have the mental flexibility and the information to while a crisis is unfolding still be able to comment intelligently and I think we are very privileged to have that people who not only at this forum but on many media platforms have volunteered to speak and I think that those of you who are university students here you need to be very proud because when I was in the university we didn't have any crisis that we had to have discussions like this on so when I was doing money and banking and international economics at Legon we just read books and imagined things but you're seeing things live so join the question and answer time, I only really expect some of the university students here to show that you are being properly taught by asking proper questions. Can the Legon students give me a wave? Can the Legon students give me a wave? Camera, please pick them. There are many here. I want to salute some um, senior people here before we get into the panel. And just to reiterate what Vivian said, that the finance minister will join us. He will make his remarks and will fit them into the flow of the conversation. Because whether his remarks come at the beginning, in the middle, or the end, is still part of a conversation, so we will not be hampered by that. I want to salute Asabi, who these days is the board chairman of the state, or if director general, executive chairman of the state enterprises commission. Non-executive, are you an executive or an executive director? <laughs> executive chairman of the state enterprises commission. You tell me whether that means that you are involved or not involved. <laughs> As a piece of my please put your together for Mr. James Asamabuati. There are quite a number of senior people here. I would recognize as the program proceeds. But I, I want to thank my panel for being here. For This is short notice because this is less than a week. And yet you took the time to come. So I've divided the panel into three. We have the legal people on the extreme side. Stay away from lawyers. <laughs> and then I have the academic people closer to me. They are the ones who mark my papers in the university. Then the finance people will join us later. So... Hopefully, the finance minister and then one of his deputies will join us so we have a nice conversation. What we, have, we have divided the conversation into three parts. So the first thing we want to find out is their initial reaction to what has gone on for the past one year. Because this has been going on since August 2017, right? Based on the perspective they are coming from, legal, corporate governance, pure economics, and other academia. How serious is this? And you will be given three minutes to make those comments. Then we will spend the next round of questions looking at examining the solution the Bank of Ghana has put together. Don't forget that the Bank of Ghana's solution had to have been corroborated by the finance ministry because you can't go and borrow two billion if the finance ministry doesn't agree. So we will analyze the cogency of the solutions that have been put forward. And then we'll talk about based on the solution that we have that has been put forth, how safe are depositors' monies? That's a very important junction to cross and then we'll end by looking at recommendations for the banking sector and the financial systems going forward so um, i don't know who wants to bail the cut they usually say ladies first but i'll start with dr ashley because you are wearing a nice blue top and you are near next to me so what are your uh, preliminary thoughts on what's been going on in the financial sector and particularly the banking sector give us your introductory remarks in three minutes your key reflections and some of the things that jumped at you when you follow these crises, thank you very much. Yes, it's on. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would say good morning to. Uh, it's a panel, so they don't stand, they sit, so we'll just focus on them. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Or well, if I could stand, that would be the best no, for me. Uh, we, we have. Uh, so where should I go? <laughs> Come to place it now. Just listen to me. You are, it's a panel, so you focus on them. Very good one. Uh, once again, good morning to. Uh, everyone here in Gadet. Uh, Sorry, let me say something. You see, this is not speeches. It's a panel, so it's a conversation. That's yeah. why we're doing this way. Yes, yeah. Yeah. The sound is not good. Okay, I use my mic. All right. 
I think this is good. No, but we see, we, we can't have speeches. It's a panel discussion. So, so you can't capture the sound? Wow. What? What? How about this? Okay, so we'll take the opening remarks on camera. Then when the panel panel starts, we will have it. So fair, fair enough. So you, you come in. Well, that's yeah. right. So make sure whatever I want to be heard on TV is said now. So, uh, the rest. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'll say good morning to uh, everyone here today. Uh, indeed, as you rightly mentioned, it's been raging on for uh, close to a year. And what has been the cause of the current situation we find ourselves in? I have been able to chance on some of the documents. You realize, indeed, it started way back somewhere 2012. You know, and the Bank of Ghana, specifically the, the Banking Supervision Department, has been accessing certain relevant information which should have informed the decisions of previous governors before date. Uh, but it looks as if we've always uh, clinged on to the popular Ghanaian cliche of it shall be well, obey ye, and hoping that the banks will turn their uh, misfortunes into uh, fortunes. If you take the case of uh, Capital Bank, for example, you realize uh, it actually had the opportunity to become a full-fledged bank uh, with an initial capital of about 14.3 million Ghana cities. This was at the time when the minimum capital required was about 60 million. And in actual fact, uh, throughout the world, you do not necessarily have to acquire or obtain all the minimum capital before you are given the opportunity to operate. However, you need to raise between 70 and 80 percent of the minimum capital to be able to set off. And then the remaining amount, you would spell out clearly how you will be able to make up for the difference, which could be through uh, further shareholder contribution or uh, raking in back that is retaining profits that you derive from your operations. But if you look at the fact that Capital Bank was allowed to start operation with 14.3 million Ghana cities, it translates in percentage terms into about 23.8% of the total minimum capital required at that time. You know, so the reverse was actually uh, set the Capital Bank in motion. It should have been the remaining or outstanding capital required for its operations and not the main capital to start with. And as uh, they went on, you realize there were challenges somewhere along the line, especially 2014, uh, which were brought to the attention of the then governor. Uh, but little was done about it. And out of about 20 recommendations, you realize in 2015, only four of these recommendations had been attended to by Capital Bank. So we've had challenges over the years, and those challenges are currently staring at us. And it is important we are able to embrace it and see how best as a nation we'll be able to address it. Uh, the financial subsector is a very sensitive area, and therefore you cannot afford to toy with it. There's an extent to which you can allow certain financial institutions to go down without touching them. After some time, you may have to intervene to ensure that there is some amount of sanity in the financial subsector. It is the fulcrum of every economy, and therefore you cannot afford to toy with it. And so the initial, I would say, is that this has been a challenge that should have been addressed long ago. Uh, what we are seeing today, uh, let me repeat here, the governor is not doing any magic. The current governor of the Bank of Ghana is not the one who has come through his mind to determine what is taking place. These are recommendations that on paper since 2015-16 and should have been implemented. So he is only rolling out what he came to inherit. And that's exactly what the situation is. And that is why this forum is very, very important for us to uh, set the record very straight. People shouldn't blame the current governor. He is actually trying to take the bull by the horn so that we end the impasse, we end the problem somewhere and see how best will be able to continue. And so that is exactly uh, the situation we find ourselves in. Now, with regards to the other banks, I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to uh, come on. But generally, uh, they're having challenges. And you realize our uh, various indigenous banks' owners have not helped us as a people. Even though they've been given tremendous opportunities, they've not been able to utilize them to the fullest. 
to the benefit of the common Ghanaian, especially their depositors. You know, let alone talk about the wider uh, populace. And that is exactly uh, why we find ourselves in the current situation. And hopefully, we are going to turn things around because the recommendations will be implemented. If we indeed aspire to have foreign investors come in, what they look out for are some of these pointers. They know every, every country has challenges with regards to its financial subsector. But the question is how proactive or how reactive is the government to some of these challenges? The answer is what informs the foreign investor's decision to bring his hard-earned currency or money into your country for investment. If not, the opportunity will be given to another nation to benefit from. And therefore, uh, no one should see this as a witch hunt. It is long overdue. Uh, uh, we don't discuss financial matters in public early enough. You try behind the scenes to address it. If it does not help, then that is why you come out public. And public too, it is not announced early. Let me say this so that those who have questions to have been asked several times why we sleep, wake up, and then hear that uh, two banks have been taken over by one bank, that's GCB taking over UT and capital banks. And then we hear of five banks being amalgamated or consolidated into one without any prior announcement. In advanced economies like the United States, UK, that is how it is done. You don't create panic in the financial subsector. So you make sure that you do the back, uh, the back end arrangement, negotiations, everything in place. By the time you make the announcement, nobody can rush to the bank for withdrawal because everything is already in place. And so the Bank of Ghana is not pulling a magic wand. It is only implementing best practices across the world. And therefore, we need to accept, embrace it, and then learn and improve on what we currently do. And I'm sure when we do this, we'll be able to move forward as a nation. And why depositors' uh, uh, monies are safe will come to that. I'm sure we'll get the opportunity. We'll count certain few numbers. I will be able to understand that nobody has to rush to the bank to withdraw, but you have to go home and sleep and believe that your money is in safe hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashley. This is a Dankwa Institute event. It's coming to you live from Alisa Hotel. We are taking preliminary comments from our panel. Dr. Ashley endorses the Bank of Ghana's position and feels that these solutions are long overdue. Our next speaker is Dr. Osei Sibe, who is an economist. He's a macroeconomist, and some of his research is into the financial sector. So we're really looking forward to hearing his thoughts on this when it happened by way of preliminary comments. So, ladies and gentlemen, our second uh, panel member, Dr. Eric Osei Esibe. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. And uh, first of all, let me thank GI uh, for putting together this very important uh, uh, forum. Yes. So, um, the financial sector developments. Um, I think that uh, first I would just like to put it in a context. Uh, what has actually brought us too far. Uh, for me, and where I sit, I wasn't too surprised to see some of the happiness, uh, some of the banks actually collapsing. Uh, because, I mean, right back as my uh, earlier speaker said, from 2012, the signs were just too very clear. Uh, where you have your economy slowing down dramatically, you have your exchange rate actually rising, uh, depreciating currency of about 39%, that was in 2014. You have your interest rates going to about 35%. And you have banks making so much profit because banks now have huge appetite to lend to the economy to the extent that between 2012 to 2014, the average growth in credit supply was about 50%. That was very high annually, 50%. So these things happening, I mean, as a teacher of monetary economy, uh, or money and banking, you know that two key things happen when your interest rates begin to rise and you begin to give too much credit. You then begin to overexpose yourself to high credit risk. The credit risk default would increase. The probability that your default rate will increase will be very high. In that case, you need to put in place risk mitigation 
mechanism to try to reduce the extent of risk. We saw that in United States 2006, 2007, 2008, where there was a credit boom and the result that it brought to the economy. So with that kind of environment, now what then means that your non-performing non, um, loan ratio will begin to rise. Now, once your non-performing ratio begins to rise, per the Central Bank Act and then per the Basel Charter, you need to match your exposure to risk to your capital. And here, let me make a quick distinction that there's a difference between leverage and capital adequacy ratio. And that is where many people confuse and say that it's perhaps because government owns so much to the uh, banking sector, that is why some of the banks are collapsing. In actual fact, it is not entirely true. Because even when you look at the entire breakdown of bank lending, only about 17 or the biggest will be about 20 or 21 percent that goes to government. Between 2012 to now, about 89 to 90 percent of all credit goes to the private sector. And only about 11 percent goes to government in that order. Now, your leverage and your capital adequacy ratio, as you begin to give more loans, and according to the Basel Charter, particularly the Charter 2, the Basel 2 Accord, you're no longer going to use your leverage as an indicator of your performance. You are now going to disaggregate your assets by weighing them according to their risk profile. So you take a risk, your, the entire asset base, and you look at how much of it has gone to government, how much of it has gone to uh, mortgage, how much of it have, go, have gone to interbank system, how much of it have gone to the uh, household and then to the corporation. Now the Basel Accord then said that if you're giving money to government, that one is seen as risk-free. So it's not going to account. So that is re zero risk rated. It wouldn't be part of it. If you're giving money to interbank, that one, sometimes it takes about 20% in terms of its weight. If you're giving money to mortgage or estate houses, it's about 50% in terms of its weight in calculation of your adequacy. However, if you're giving money to individuals, um, organizations and corporations is about 100%. So the entire 100% is going to be charged as part of your the calculation of your capital adequacy ratio. So really giving money to government will not weigh that have gone to the private sector in calculating your factor adequacy ratio. So, when these things were happening and not performing loans were increasing, in um, exercise, uh, which was also backed by the IMF when we had to go to the IMF and push the government to carry out this exercise. And it highlighted of the banking sector, that the banking sector have to do reclassification because the method that they had used earlier on did not conform to the view that banks' assets were of very low quality and their capital, there's also huge capital deficiency in the, uh, the banking sector. As well in particular the energy sector, and then also going beyond their uh, single uh, obligo limits in that all of it goes against the banking soundness and the stability of the bank was for banks to up their capital base in order to match this high risk that banks have taken. So from what
the solution will be to what? Ask banks to up their capital through increasing their minimum capital requirement. Okay. Otherwise, as we have mentioned, what that means is that banks net worth. That means if you take their liabilities and their assets, and if you net it, if you take a liability out of their assets, the remaining one is going to be negative because banks' assets have deteriorated so badly that if every depositor wants to go to the bank to withdraw their money, they, the banks will not have enough money to what, actually uh, pay them. So there was a need for a safety net and cushioning, which then means that banks have to raise their capital. So that is exactly what happened. And I think that as the discussion goes on, I'll come back to uh, tell more about the issues. Thank you very much. So Dr. Eric Osei Sibe is uh, an economist, and he is trying to establish the economic basis for the policy solution. He distinguishes capital adequacy from leverage, and then he explains why a capital cushion is the right solution. He will elaborate on that as well. Now, let's bring in our next two panelists. But while before we, before we do that, we want to alert you that you are live on radio, you are live on CTFM, and if you are listening to us, you can send us a, a Twitter message, and we'll be happy to read it. Just tweet at CT973, and we'll read your comments. We are also live on City TV, and as you watch the program, we will put a number on the screen for you to send a comment. So we've heard from two of our principal speakers. They are from the financial and economic side. Uh, Dr. Ebenezer is a financial consultant, and Dr. Eric Osei-Sibe is an economist. Now, if you listen to the governor, there were also issues of corporate governance and supervision. We will come to that shortly, but I want to welcome Finance Minister, the Honorable Ken Oforiata, who just came in at the right time, and he will join us to give us some brief remarks. So please put your hands together for Ken. And then, while he sits down to drink some water, I will update him on what has happened so far. Uh, he's Jodu Boahim. Charles is, is Deputy Minister for Finance. And we know Charles worked in the capital market. So we have some special questions for Charles when Ken leaves. We won't ask him when Ken is here. So we'll ask Charles some difficult questions when Ken goes away. So Ken, you're welcome, Finance Minister, uh, Deputy Finance Minister, and your team. This is the something Akligo is also the head of financial institutions at the Ministry of Finance. Thank you for coming. This is a Dankwa Institute event. We're live on radio and television. Uh, you missed two very nice opening remarks. Um, our first speaker was Dr. Ebenezer Ashley. He gave a perspective from financial consultancy, and he thought that the decision by the Bank of Ghana made a lot of sense. Dr. Eric Osei is an economist, and he established the economic basis for where we are. We're about to jump into the legalities, but we know today is a busy day for you. So what we will do is to invite you to give your opening remarks, and then you may leave us when you have to, because we have Charles here with us throughout the day. So Ace and Clara, with your permission, I will uh, ask that the Minister for Finance, and he will need to come to this side, uh, Ken Ufori Atta, bring us the opening thoughts to set the scene properly for us, from the fiscal economic management perspective. Please put your hands together for Finance Minister Ken Ofori Atta. Good morning. Great. It's, it's, it's good to be here. And um, real apologies. I had um, one of the rating companies, and you can't quite voice them off easily when they come. Since they, they impact our rating and uh, one sentence can be one percent. <laughs> um, so real apologies for that. Um, um, so really, let me thank the Duncan Institute for, for, for this platform. And Bernard, thanks again for, for your forbearance uh, in all of this. Um, saying greetings to, um, to, to all of you. It's, um, these are difficult moments um, for, for all of us, and it's really kind of uncharted territory. Um, so um, 
but I think it, it requires um, courage um, to do the right thing um, so that even if there are mistakes, um, there will be honest mistakes, however you define what an honest mistake is. Um, but, um, so it is really one of the most reflective um, periods um, in our financial um, industry. And it is um, a call to duty um, uh, as, as we try to understand um, to fix um, what what we have we have come to see, uh, but again, I believe that the leadership um, at the Bank of Ghana has risen up to the challenge. Um, uh, in a period that happens to be one of the most, uh, I guess, reprehensible in our financial industry, uh, and maybe in, in the many years um, to come. Um, so we came into government. Um, with uh, energy to re-energize the financial system and strengthen the architecture. Our aim was to implement policies that will ensure that we lower cost of credit to the private sector, keep focus on capital markets and securitization, speed up work on the establishment of the Ghana Commodities Exchange, and set up a national development bank to focus on industry and agriculture. Essentially, a robust system um, to be able to take the country uh, where we want to be uh, beyond, beyond aid. Uh, but since January 2017, uh, we've been confronted um, uh, with information on the industry that reflects widespread systemic abuse uh, and historic uh, ineptitude in protecting our industry that is at the heart of our future. Um, the asset quality review done by the Bank of Ghana in 2016 set a tone for what is to um, confront confront the government uh, when more than nine banks were found to be problematic, and mostly on Bank of Ghana lifeline, emergency liquidity support. Uh, we also had issues uh, in in the. Um, some legacy debt that uh, we had to we had to to resolve. So as, as we look to to tackle these, uh, it has become apparent that has uh, occurred. I mean, I think it's easy to um, generalize and talk about um, a bank trade uh, or bank restructuring, etc. Uh, but the heart of the matter. Um, is that it's really plain thievery um, uh, on the citizens um, by certain uh, bank shareholders uh, and directors. Uh, also with a clear compromise of the regulatory leader on a scale uh, that has not happened before in our country's history. Um, that um, bank shareholders and directors were di diverting depositors' money for personal gain, and that there were no checks and balances in how uh, inter-party transactions were done, uh, and bank directors and shareholders could lend other people's money to themselves without any process. And other times, uh, people will show money as evidence um, to set up banks and turn around to take those same um, deposits, and leaving the banks with little or no working capital. Um, so we, we have destroyed um, quite quite a bit. And, and what, what are we trying to fix? Uh, um, so the total size of Ghana's financial sector um, grew from 22 billion in 2020, which was 48% of GDP, um, to 160 billion, 77.8% of GDP by 2017. Uh, of, these, of these, deposit money banks and non-bank financial institutions are dominant of assets of about 110 billion, um, and this accounted for about 68% of the total assets of the financial services sector and 53.4% um, of, of GDP. Uh, pension funds um, had increased. Uh, from 21 
um, billion in assets, um, which is about percent of GDP, um, to now about 13 percent of GDP. The fund management sector, um, excluding pensions, um, had assets of about 24 billion. Um, has moved to about now 15 percent of financial sector's total assets. Uh, the insurance sector. Uh, with assets of about 4.6 billion, 2.9% um, of the financial sector's total assets. And stock market capitalization was almost 60 billion, representing 29% or so of GDP. Uh, the financial services sector is actually estimated um, to employ um, some 1,000 direct and indirect jobs, of which a significant number are in the middle class. As of June 2018, credit to the private sector was also estimated at about 34 billion, uh, which is 14% of GDP. Um, so this is what uh, we have, and this is what government has to protect. Um, so we, we have to balance all of this um, with um, some potential job losses, but you are looking at 50,000, they have to protect, and you look at 54% um, of your GDP in assets that have to be protected. Um, so um, it is not an assignment that therefore uh, can be done, uh, done loosely, uh, but the impact um, uh, of negligence uh, on the part of either the government or the Bank of Ghana uh, would have led to uh, derailing um, the entire economy and the hard work that we've all put in there um, will just have been uh, smoke screen. Um, so we've had to do this to ensure that we protect the, uh, the credible and safe financial institutions, of which there are many. We must ensure that depositors and investors don't lose their money. Um, we must uh, make sure that there's prosecution uh, for all those who are involved. Um, so in this path, uh, it's really about the destiny of our country, uh, patriotism, and in a desire to do all we can as leaders to protect the state and the over 27 million Ghanaians. Um, so, so far, uh, we spent about 8 billion Ghana cities to protect depositors and to protect the jobs which otherwise um, would have gone with the collapse of the banks. Um, and honestly, we'll continue in the spirit of financial stability and protecting the Republic to ensure that government stand ready and to protect all depositors until the end of this year when the process um, will have a clarity on the way forward and other banks uh, would also have to recapitalize. Uh, but but the, the, the push towards recapitalization uh, has nothing to do um, with the problems that we are trying to solve. That's a whole different issue. As the banks be made stronger um, so that they can continue uh, with the business of intermediation um, that, that is required. Uh, so let's rest assured that with over 8 billion bailout of the sector, it also presents an opportunity for sweeping reforms that will ensure that some of these lapses um, do not occur again. We have Form, uh, having a plan of all regulators to increase minimum capital requirements, which will ensure that we have at least well capitalized and strong institutions. Uh, we also continue to urge re regulators to introduce risk capital requirements um, as a supplement. So we've conducted a comprehensive study on financial sector regulation to begin the process um, of really um, restructuring um, the regulatory architecture um, that will best serve um, our country. And our plan is to have an honest conversation and dialogue such as this, um, so that we incorporate all of it. And we begin to see um, the part, the part we have all played uh, in that. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> I, I, I really um, do not understand how we got, we got to this level. <laughs> Um, uh, but but we, we did we did get to, we did get to this level, you know. The, I mean, sort of speaking of the curve. I mean, a, a banking license 
um, ladies and gentlemen, is actually, uh, in, a, in a very crude way, uh, a license to steal money if there's no regulation. Because essentially you have permission to take your money and my money, and if there's no regulation, you do what you want with it. You know? So when you open the barn, uh, in which therefore there's so much forbearance, uh, and people who receive the licenses, you know, uh, do not uh, meet the fit and proper test, uh, and they themselves are not bankers, uh, you, you create a certain situation. And then when you look at your capacity as an institution and ask yourself, how many banks or in financial institutions can you actually regulate? Uh, and you don't have your own ceiling as your um, technical capacity, human capacity, and you give more licenses than you can support. It leads to certain weaknesses, you know. Uh, when also uh, we begin a process where, um, let's say, um, state institutions uh, were literally keeping their monies at the Bank of Ghana um, so that there was a certain security, and you allow all of that to be out there so that the banks then go after these CFOs and CEOs of state enterprises. Uh, then you, you get into these facilitation fees uh, in which truly um, the, the CFOs in all these state institutions should be able to do an assessment of each bank to see their capacity, their balance sheet, uh, and therefore be more discriminated as to where they put their money. Uh, you you can't really sort of blame the average retail person because once he or she sees that there's a line in the bank, she, he has to presume that it is being managed well. Uh, but truly, uh, for the sophisticated quote-unquote depositor, uh, the CFOs, etc., of the major institutions who put their monies into these places, and those are questions um, that have to be asked. Um, so we need to start certainly uh, from the central bank, uh, understand um, how this came to be, uh, and also um, look at you know some of the more sophisticated institutions uh, who put their monies in certain banks, um, and then also look at the shareholders and directors um, uh, and the management of some of these banks as to what has happened for us to now put eight billion CDs into trying to, to, to manage a potential um, collapse. So, so that, that, is, that is our responsibility. Um, and, and I think um, um, the reforms are, are important um, at the heart of the relations that we are seeing um, is just really uh, um, a very sad situation. Um, so that the groups of leaders in charge of the regulatory institutions, and businessmen and women who are taking decisions um, to ensure um, that the average citizen is not robbed. Um, I believe that um, uh, our country will remain strong and that uh, under uh, the leadership and, and what um, we are um, looking um, to do, uh, we're going to have a much more robust uh, financial um, services uh, services sector. Uh, we, we shouldn't um, be afraid um, of, 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 of what is happening. Uh, we should have confidence that the financial system is going to be much stronger. They just come back um, to, the, to the old ways of, of honesty, respect, and regulation um, so that the financial continue to be safer, um, stay more secure, uh, and to be much stronger after, after this, this, this cleanup. Uh, certainly, um, there are going to be some victims, um, very unfortunately, um, but when you look at 50,000 jobs and change, uh, uh, and then um, the jobs that we might lose uh, in this, um, find ways of retraining and reintegrating them uh, into, into the industry. Um, but I think it's, you know, be, beyond um, all, all of that that is happening, um, you can see a very methodical way at which we, we have also come to this. Uh, the Bank of Ghana, as you know, uh, has recently issued uh, final guidelines on corporate governance 
for banks and specialized deposited institutions uh, are part of measures uh, to require financial institutions to adopt a sort of sound corporate uh, governance principles and best practices. Uh, the Bank of Ghana also recently established a new office called the Office of Ethics and Internal Investigation uh, to strengthen good governance within the bank and to promote the highest standards of ethical conduct commensurate with the bank's mandate. Um, we at the Ministry of Finance uh, are sending, you know, sort of a formal letter um, to BOG, um, really um, to look into their own internal processes and therefore cover the people uh, who participate uh, in this um, should really be, be brought um, to book uh, within within um, the Bank of Ghana that, that we are looking at. Uh, furthermore, the Bank of Ghana also hopes um, to apply Basel 2 and 3 uh, capital framework effective uh, from January 2019. The application of these standards will certainly yield effective participation in strengthening important aspects in the area of good governance uh, in banks. Um, credit rating um, is going to be key. The deposit protection um, law um, is, is also going to be key. And so at the end, and as much as possible, uh, our duty is to ensure that no depositor um, loses out. Uh, we are determined, the Ministry of Finance, to give um, all of the support required um, to build a robust uh, Ghanaian banking uh, framework. Um, the goal is to turn Ghana into the regional financial services hub, um, and I think with this cleanup, um, it puts us on course um, to be able to do that. Um, these are very difficult times uh, because you and I uh, would know someone um, who may be impacted or affected in that but I think we, we all really need um, to look at that um, as we talk about this. Uh, we need your support uh, and prayers of every Ghanaian. Uh, communicators must be measured uh, in their words. Um, this clearly um, should not be about witch hunting, but about cleaning um, the system. Um, there's no need to create panic in the economy. Uh, we have it under control. We are confident um, that will be able to um, emerge out a uh, much stronger and more robust um, sense of financial services in this country. Um, the law, of course, uh, must take its due course, uh, but our interest is uh, protect these jobs, uh, protect depositors, and the most important pillar of the economy, the financial industry. We cannot let it go. Um, so, fellow citizens, uh, may God richly bless all of us at home in Ghana, make us great and strong as we try to keep um, to be each other's um, keeper uh, in the days and weeks and months ahead. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this and rest assured that um, we will stay awake uh, until all is done. Thank you. Minister of Finance, Ken Ufoyata, thank you very much. Please help him with another round of applause as he, as he makes his way back to the seat. This is the Dankwa Institute's uh, Forum on the Banking Sector. I want to now see challenges. Since he's finished, I want to call it crisis again. So the, we've changed the name of the program since we finished talking. So it's now the Banking Sector Challenges. And we have a panel discussion. We, first part of the panel spoke. We haven't heard from the other panelists. So can just give to endorse some of the points we've had. Very interesting point he makes that the minimum capital requirement has nothing to do with what's going on. And I'll take your comments on that later on. That struck me. He touched on some corporate governance issues, which I believe signals nicely into the comments of my next panel members. So uh, Madam Clara Kasati is a legal luminary. She does both teaching and corporate law. And she's also strong on corporate governance. Before I bring her up, I want to mention that we also have Deputy Information Minister Kojo Ponkrum. Also, so what did I say? He is the Deputy Information Minister and is the Information Minister designee. Yes. So he hasn't yet been sworn in. Yes. So Kojo, thank you for joining us. There are some two seats on the left, so you can come into this side and come and sit down, so you can have a nice program. 
I'm also going to bring Charles up to join the panel when Clara starts talking. So the next speaker is lawyer Clara Kasati. And I want her to, to handle more because when we listen to the governor, he said a couple of things. He says there was severe capital impairment, there was misuse of liquidity, there was poor supervision, and then there was weak corporate governance. So I'm giving you the hint as to where I want you to go, the governance side. Please be translated for Clara Kasati for our opening remarks on the Ghana banking sector challenges. Um, thank you very much, um, Bernard. And good morning to everybody and the finance minister as well. I was actually hoping that uh, my senior, A. Sankuma, would have come before I come. I'm sure that most of you know that we like, in the legal fraternity, we like to call senior, senior, depending on um, who is older. We usually have two types. You have the senior who is the person who is just senior to you at the bar, or you have senior properly so-called. And the senior properly so-called is the person that you did pupillage under, the person who trained you when you graduated from law school freshly. Um, this happens to be one of the five senior who trained me when I graduated fresh from law school. So he's my senior properly so-called. Together with Mr. Kobe Binti, divine lecher, Seti, and then Mrs. So I was hoping that he would take the opportunity before I mean. Anyway, is there a national crisis we are facing? Definitely. It is a national crisis not because one bank has gone under. We are talking about seven in total. That's huge. So we do have a national crisis. And now that we have the national crisis, we will concentrate on national issues. We do not divert the differences or personalities matter. Of course, as the finance minister noted, that came in, in how those who are acted with the money, and not them, but how the regulator in this situation also regulated the persons who were, who were monitoring, who had the responsibility to manage the banks. Common through all the reports, including what the finance minister has, has been the issue of corporate governance. Basically, corporate governance is a system of accountability. It's like if you compare it to our constitution, we have separation of power. So you have the corporate governance being some form of separation of power between the various persons in the corporate setup, the shareholders, the company secretary, the directors, the auditors, and to an extent your opinion so that you are able to do what is required of you to do and to comply. I actually found it quite strange that this happened in the regulated industry. Because this is not just any industry, regulated industry. And when you have a regulated industry, you have somebody responsible for regulating, more or less overseeing how affairs are being managed. In this particular case, the main regulator being the Bank of Ghana. So whilst we are resolving the crisis, what I would want to see, the steps first of all within the Bank of Ghana. I am more interested in what happened within the Bank of Ghana. The reason being that if you look at the legal framework that we have, if the Bank of Ghana was doing its job well, we shouldn't arrive at where we have arrived at. So our first, for me, the first point of contact, the first point of the first contact is within the Bank of Ghana. What went wrong? And then if we find out what went wrong, the structures, the restructuring we are talking about, it's not just another bunch of as we, we like to do. We pass laws, then we set up institutions, then we go to sleep. And then several years back uh, down the line, we come. Yeah, this is also time for us to take audit of the various institutions and bodies we've set up. Have they been how well have they done what we have set them up to do? If they are well, then we are just wasting money. Because I don't get the point where we set up institutions, joint people to those offices, start paying them salaries together with other facilities, and then we, the problem for which we set them up is still there. It's time. It's not just a once more. 
going about it, passing the law, setting up the institutions, appointing people to occupy those positions, and then we go back to sleep. The public must also learn to watch. And we must learn to actually demand. I think we've set up a lot of institutions. This is time since 92 to take an audit of each of the institutions that we have set up. And we are paying. We pay taxes so that these institutions can function. We need to find out how well have they functioned. Have they been doing very well the reasons for which we set them up? And they, have, they are not. What should we do? Should we keep them and just be losing more money? Or should we find some other solution? So the issue here, I would want to look at the governance level from within the Bank of Ghana itself, the checks and balances in place, how that is resolved, and how those who were responsible are held accountable. It's not about punishing. But we also have to learn the culture of accountability. One of my disappointments with Ghanaian is that most of the time when we get the opportunity, we miss it. We miss the funds. We miss the funds. And then we end up not taking a very good opportunity to do something right. I'm hoping this is not this will not be one of them. That we're having this issue, we take the in the management of the company, in establishing the required systems, then what is, why, why are you being a board member? If you can't, just decline and then at least let somebody else who can, who can do the job, do the job. So in short, I, I, don't, I don't intend this to be a long speech because we've had a, a, a lot of speeches. I'm sure in the discussions the issues will come up. But once again, my whole point is that I am hoping that as a people, this is a time that we see problem and that we are able to resolve it and move away from what we are all familiar with which is pass some more laws that we don't intend to enforce because this fellow wasn't because there no laws it's not that there was a problem with the laws it was just a problem with enforcement and committing
So I hope that once more our solution will not be that let's pass some laws and then after passing some laws let's create some offices. After creating some offices let's appoint people to those offices and then we go back to sleep. But this time we will all stay involved because as we can realize when we go to sleep we will feel it in our pockets. Because at the end of the day we are the ones who will be called up to pay in the form of taxes. Thank you. Wow. Clara Kasati, she's a, a corporate lawyer and a law lecturer, and we have also appointed her a, a political commentator. Very powerful indeed. Very solid. We love that. This is a Danko Institute event. We're live on City TV and City FM. I want to apologize for those of you who are standing at the back. We are making arrangements to get some seats in the aisle if health and safety permits. So you can sit down. And um, we know that the finance minister has other places to go, so we will not be grudging if he leaves uh, whilst the conversations are going on. And if you are talking and he leaves, it's not because he's angry that you are talking, it's just because he has to go. So just to let you know. Uh, Charles, if you are going to stay, then I want you to come up. I have a seat for you. So, or you will run away with him. Yeah, you are staying. So, Charles, I don't mind. Please put your hands up for Charles to come to the front. He's the deputy minister of finance. Um, so, a couple of things we'll do. In the final, we need to find out the solutions that have been put forward and whether they address the issues or simply window dressing. And we also want to know how it will take what we because as Ken said, there are people who look at us from outside and whatever we see here, they will listen to it and take decisions that may affect us. And because Charles used to work in the markets, we'll be very interested to know how thoughtful we've put the solutions in place so that the market reaction will be the one Ghana wants and not the other one that others would prefer. So let's now bring in Ace Ankuma. Clara has already uh, given us a teaser. I'm sure this is going to be the case. Ace Ankuma is a political practitioner, and he's also into strong corporate law. We have the largest law firm in the country, and he's going to share his thoughts on the banking challenge. Please be transcribed. Thanks, thanks very much. I hope I realize that my reputation is a very good one. Um, and so when Banco Institute invited me, I turned them down. I said, I'm not going to get involved with this because I, I may not know how to control myself. And um, finally, this morning, I was dragged, kicking and screaming here. So I rushed to my office to put my thoughts down in less than 20 minutes. But I'm not going to inflict that on you. Um, I'm not going to inflict that on you. Clara, I, aren't, aren't you just amazed by Clara's intelligence and, uh, and, um, and her strength of character? I assure you that I take more of what Clara does, but it gives you an indication as to the kind of people who pass through our hands. Um, Ghana, well, I like the terms corporate governance and all the nice economic terms you use. Who is talking about stealing? Yeah, the finance minister, oh, that, as for you, your own is different. <laughs> Who's talking about stealing? Plain theft. Now, once we, I mean, I agree, there's uh, indicators and the macroeconomic, you know. Yeah. Look, Anna said something about Africa, which is probably true, that Africa doesn't need strong men or women. We need strong He might have been right for Africa. He was wrong about Ghana. He didn't read his notes. CIA didn't brief him well. Ghana has every institution to push. What we lack are the men with testicular fortitude and the women with normal fortitude and the spine to enforce the law. Simple. <laughs> Next time, don't invite me. <laughs> and this is on live TV. You're in trouble. Don't waste right. Let's continue this issue. Let's look at the basic thing on banking. The Lord Christ talked about Let me talk about the power of talent. And said the lowest thing you can do with your money Take it to the, to the user through usury, which is not a very, not a, a very nice word, but it's, it, the, the root is useless. It's the use of money. And so, if the least thing a, a Ghanaian can do when he or she has money is to give it to the bank. The, the biggest protection of our money when it goes to the bank is from armed robbers who will come to our house at night holding pistols and guns and knives, only to find out that the best way to the bank now is not to wear a mask and have a gun, but to own a bank. I said, next time they invite me. Where are the powers 
of the Registrar General. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had law in this country since 1963. That could kill this in one fell swoop. The Registrar General alone can stop all of this without us even getting to Bank of Ghana. And maybe when the panel discussion, I'll go a bit into it. I told Bernard, don't get tired of me. Tell me, I'll sit down. Where are the powers of the Bank of Ghana? I'll get to that. Where are the powers of the state? <laughs> really, were there lawyers in these banks? We must shine the light on ourselves. Were there auditors? Or have the external auditors become like the man at my fuel station? And whenever I ask him for a receipt, which is, which is when I've told him to keep the five cities change, he will ask Master Mentro saying, in other words, Master, how much should I write on the receipt? Look, why has this gone on? Dooms, nay, knows that the Bank of Ghana may not or has not done a lot or maybe anything historically. We, in, in Ghana, the Banking Act, the Act 930, which literally crowns Bank of Ghana the of banking in Ghana. It is one of the most powerful statutes regulating banks anywhere in the world. And do you know why? It was part when this contagion began. So we saw the mess and realized that the 2004 Act was probably not broad enough to cover it. So we deliberately sat down and in September and October 2016, passed a law to give Bank of Ghana the power to deal with this. Literally, the bank can decimate a, a fly with a sledgehammer. There are administrative fines, court fines, jail terms, disqualification of persons, primarily aimed at protecting the public and the depositor, who has assumed that the best protection is to go to the bank. So, Obama was wrong. We have the institutions. We have the law. Whence come the men and women? That is why I am not ashamed to say two thumbs up to Dr. Ernest Addison. I am not, in fact, not two thumbs up, slam dunk. And his current team. The law exists. The report on the failing banks exists. The 2014 and 2015 banking examination reports are there. They spoke the truth. Foreign investors tried to invest in some of these institutions and found the contagion, ran away, and gave the report to the Bank of Ghana. It didn't do diddly squat. Some law firms in this country did legal due diligence for intended um, 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 investors. They saw the contagion. They wrote the due diligence report. It went to Bank of Ghana. They didn't do squat. We can live here without them. They didn't do squat. All Ghana needed were the men and women to deal with this. Let's go to 1963. Or even before that. You understand the, the concept of the company. That the company, when it's incorporated, exists separately from its shareholders and directors. That's basic law. Company law 101. But that also means that the assets of the company do not belong to the directors and shareholders. Excuse me, Mr. Shareholder, Madam Shareholder. Your only entitlement to money from the company is in your dividend. One. Two. You are only paid a dividend when the company has made profit. Three. You are only paid the dividend when the directors have declared profit. Apart from that, the Companies Act, which we passed in 1983, makes illegal any other distribution to shareholders. In fact, to distribute anything to shareholders, you need to go to court for an order. So that you can put your money in and take it out. This is not a susu scheme. Company law is serious business. So if you put your money in the company, all you get is dividend. You are not entitled to take a car home. When you die, the company's assets won't be shared. But we do not seem to understand that. Now, and so if you, and directors, all you are entitled to are your certain allowances, director's fees, and whichever salary is given to you. Same with employees. The company's money is not your money. So if you run a bank and the bank has six billion cities and you put your hands in the six billion and put it in your pocket, you have stolen. What's the definition of stealing? Our law says, quote, a person steals who dishonestly appropriates a thing of which that person is not the owner, unquote. <laughs> Simple. So <laughs> the money is not yours. It's for the it has been put there by depositors. If you put your hand in it and put it in your pocket, you have been dishonest, you have appropriated, the thing is not yours, you are a thief. Go to jail. If you pass gold, don't take 200. 
So why are we molly coddling this issue? Why are we talking so nice terms, so nicely about it? Look, if we got that right, we, the capital adequacy and others might not even come up. <laughs> Look, right, let, let's continue. Uh, stop me when, you, when, when you're tired. Then, even when, even under normal company law, we had rules on lifting the veil because the law realized that people would hide behind the company and say, it's the company who did it. It's not me. So basic rules on lifting the veil shows instances where the law would disregard the corporate veil and hit at the people who are trying to steal behind from the back of the company. In Ghana, 2003, Justice Yarpel, who is on now the Supreme Court, gave a decision and he described the corporate veil as a boomerang. That person who is trying to exploit, exploit it, trust me, in Ghana, this boomerang doesn't work. It only hits the company. In 2016, when we began to see where the world was going, especially after the Enron issues, we passed an amendment to our Companies Act, which introduced the concept of the beneficial owner, which is really this ominous Greece, who sits at the back, but whose name is not in the books, but who chops all the and who controls everything. It now demands that your particulars must state every beneficial owner. And it must be your annual returns, address, email address. So if you are looking for who is using the, the directors as puppets, we will go after the person. This exists in our law. Now, our law also says, Registrar General, com Companies Registry, if the company is being run fraudulently, if people are being defrauded by the company, the company's registrar can institute his or her own inquiry into the company and demand all records and books from the company. And if the company's registrar determines that wrong has been committed, depositors' monies are being blown on, on properties and assets and being shifted through layers and webs of companies, the company's registrar has the power to write to the attorney general, make a report, and the directors and officers will be prosecuted. Not just that. The registrar general can then go to court and seek a court order for the just and equitable winding up. But this is the more powerful power. The registrar general can then institute an action in the name of the company against all people who are stolen from the company or, or use the company to defraud other people for compensation. We have had this law in our statute book since 1963. I have no record of any decided case where this power has been exercised. And so Clive's right. We might just pass a few more laws, rub ourselves on the back, as to how current we are, and do nothing about it. Why, why would we do anything about it? In 2016, when we passed Act 9, 930, we gave the Bank of Ghana more power than it, it probably needs. It can do literally anything, and it, we introduced stronger concepts on the insider and on related party transactions. An insider includes your wife. Can I just read the, the, <laughs> the, the definition of insider? Sorry, I, like I said, I was typing this morning, so my. contracts to them. You are banned from giving contracts to them unless the contracts are on completely commercial terms. And so if the, your, your, your son's company is providing services to the bank, you can't give it to them on preferential terms. They can't charge you more than the market will charge you. And if you do that, you have sinned against the law. You should go to jail. Why are we having a long discussion on this? I'm coming to an end. <laughs> we don't need another law. We need men and women to enforce the law. Some of what I've seen is shocking. As I read them, I cannot believe it. But guess what? It has happened. And many of us might look at it and say, oh, they were just smart. Our law says you can't be that smart with depositors' funds. But I'll end with a caveat. Let's not rush 
the Bank of Ghana. I know enough to know that white collar issues and white collar crimes are some of the most difficult to prosecute. If you make a mistake and you lose one, you've lost your mojo. So watch Muller and what he's doing in the US slowly, very slowly. But when he hits, he files 18 charges, knowing that even one can take you to jail for 10 years. And by the time the jury brings a verdict, at least eight. And so if you begin to multiply, the 70-year-old may be in jail for about 10 years. And because it's a federal crime, at least he must serve 80% of it. And so let's allow Ghana's mullers a little bit of space and time. But they too, they should hurry up small. Thank you. Wow. That was it's Anna Nankuma, the uh, other lawyer on the panel. We want to thank all of you. This is the Dankwa Institute Forum on the Ghana Banking Sector, which is just not just analyzing the past, but also looking forward with a view to get particularly depositors to understand what has gone on so that their confidence in the banking sector would be enhanced. So we've heard from four panelists, we've heard from the finance minister. The major thing we need to do now is to analyze some of the key things that have happened. We don't have time to do all of this. I have in front of me, for example, 27 steps the Bank of Ghana took in reference to three banks, UT, Capital and Sovereign. We can't review all the 27 steps, but we can summarize into three broad themes. And I'll take comments from the panel members on whether these actions are far-reaching enough. So, for example, we know that in the case of UT and Capital Bank, they have become part of GCB Bank, and we supported GCB Bank with $2.2 .2 billion from the market. Cities, forgive me, 2.2 .2 billion cities. Thank you, Kojo, from, from the market. So that's one solution we can analyze. In the case of the five banks, we also, know, of course, the licenses were revoked as well. Sovereign and Royal, Unibank, as well as Con Construction Bank and Beige, we also know that their licenses were revoked and they were consolidated into a fully state-owned bank. Again, we needed to take some money to support them as well. So on the economic side, I would need comments from, from there. But on the legal side, looking at, for example, Eagle Project, and this one would go towards Ace and Clara, I see here, for example, that all shareholders and ex-directors of the banks, and in this case, it was Capital, UT, and Sovereign, have undertaken a written commitment of prohibition from any financial market institution for five years. How far-reaching is this? Also, they've done what they call an asset recovery of some of the banks and the shareholders. What does that mean? Does that mean that our money is being collected back? They also said, for example, that an interim management board will be put in place to manage the banks whilst they wound down. But very importantly, three committees were set up by the Bank of Ghana. They recommended that before we go there, liquidity support also will be treated differently. That instead of it be seen as cash pool to be drawn from, liquidity support will be issued as a collateralized credit facility to be drawn down on a need basis rather than as a pool of cash. Every drawdown will be approved for a specific utilization by the BOG appointed advisor. This advisor will serve on the board of the recipient bank. And any drawdown must be accompanied by a note from the recipient's auditors confirming that the recipient is a going concern as well as an, a memorandum which is circulated to members of the Financial Stability Committee. So this is something I want a comment on. How far-reaching is this? And then, as I indicated, BOG established two important committees. The first one is called an Internal Financial Stability Committee, which reviews the BOG's internal supervision and licensing reports. They note that these, um, the BOG would audit these internal reports prior to any steps being undertaken in coordination with other regulators. Second, BOG will establish an interregulatory committee comprising of Securities and Exchange Commission, National Insurance Commission, Financial Intelligence Center, etc., etc. So maybe let me start with Charles. You are from the fiscal side, and listening to some of the things the BOG puts in place, how confident were you guys on the financial side that this is the right way to go, for which reason you endorse, for example, the 2.2 billion CD market they went to borrow from? Because you had to have convinced yourself that these steps are far-reaching enough to agree to put your, your name to a new loan, essentially, to fill the hole created 
by the bank. So I'll start with you, then I'll take the two economists' views on some of the specific things the BOG did on the liquidity side, then I'll take the views of the lawyers on the other things that were done. So if that makes sense, Charles, I'm sure the cameramen want to film you here. So even though you are not giving a speech, they would like you to come and stand here to talk so that you can take a nice shot of you for their 8 p.m. bulletin. Vivian Kailoko, City News at 8, CNR. So, Charles, I do buy him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for having us here, and thanks to the Danko Institute for organizing this. I must say I've been, you know, uh, these days of social media it makes, you know, it very interesting when you are on the private sector side, now you're sitting on this side, and you're listening to the Good evening, this is The Point of View. We're live on City TV. Tune in to The Point of View, Mondays and Wednesdays at 9 p.m. as Bernard Avlet takes the news further. He will bring the right guests, ask them the relevant questions, and get you the real insights you need on the big stories for the day. We, um, we need taxes to run the economy. Um, how do you do it sensibly and have the least pernicious effect? in terms of cascading through the economy. And I think that is the thinking that is required. It's not a denial that we need taxes, you know. And, and I think that that is the difference uh, in the two administrations. The Point of View with Bernard Affleck, Monday and Wednesday nights, only on CTTV. To do it. I think that has been the key issue that has been missing in this whole thing. Because everybody knew what the problems were. And also, I think systems we need to begin to realize that human beings make mistakes and that people can be persuaded to look the other way and you need to more and more put in place the systems that don't give them the discretion and ability to you know massage the numbers or change things around because the reports were there if you go and look through the the board minutes, you see all the reports, they're there, banking supervision, they went out, they came back, they made their report, somehow mysteriously, between when the report was given and when the actions were supposed to take in, something changed. It's amazing, it's like there's some gremlins in there that just get up and tweak things around. So, you know, you realize that if you have systems in place, then it, it, it removes that temptation for human intervention and for things to change. So I think we need to more and more rely on putting in place the right systems to ensure that going forward this doesn't happen again. The other thing I think is about this, the concept of being your brother's keeper. You know, it's, it's amazing, but we've gone to a point now in Ghana where there's an armed robbery going on or some car is being hijacked on the road and people will just drive by. Nobody will stop. Or you can be hurt by the roadside and try and flag down a car. Nobody stops. Nobody stops to help anybody, you know. And that's not the way it was when we were growing up. People cared about each other, you know. You could go across to your next door neighbor and go and borrow, you know, some milk that you replace the next day, and so forth and so on. We, we looked out for each other. And nowadays, nobody does. I mean, we all knew, in, in the banking circles, everybody knew which banks were the bad banks, which ones were doing what they were doing. But no, nobody reported it or, you know, pointed it out or even came out to make any kind of broad statement. You know, I remember on the politics side, there was a lot of noise. I mean, politicians won't hesitate to go to court to file this or that or that and that against so and so and so. But I didn't see that happening when we knew perfectly well what was going in the banking sector. And nobody stepped up and said, hey, look, the way things are going, we're going to be in trouble. 
let us insist on people doing the right thing and calling people out and saying that so so and so and so and so should be, be, be held accountable. And if we don't look out for each other and put each other in check, we're not going to collectively as a people be able to move forward. Same thing with um, tax collection, you know. Nobody pays any taxes. We don't care. I mean, you know, we just move along. But then when something happens, we're all complaining. I mean, something like this where we have incurred a six billion tax bill. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's alarmed because they realize that, oh, that money is going to come out of my pocket. Aha, uh -huh, now you're worried about it. But when you didn't think about it that way, it was like somebody else's problem. You know, so until the problem seems to be hitting you directly in the pocket, that's when you get concerned. But if we were collectively concerned and our brothers keep it up front, we'll never have to get to this situation in the first place. So I think in conclusion, what I'm trying to say is that the systems are there, it's about enforcement. And it's about people realizing that if you do things wrongly, you have to pay a price for it. So we really need to see this through to the very end and make sure that lessons are learned and we don't find ourselves back here again. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. So now, still at the Dankwa Institute Forum, I have to bring in the two financial people briefly. Um, I want your quick thoughts on what has happened with, don't forget, the first two banks, they were sort of pushed into GCB, which is our biggest bank. We took some loan to support them. Was it the right decision? And then don't forget that the five other banks, there were different things. Okay, for some it was poor capital, for others it was taking depositors' funds to do other things. So the formation of concentrated banks. So if Ebenezer first, Dr. Eli, your quick thoughts on the solution. There's a mic in front of you. Then I'll take um, uh, Dr. Osei as well. What are your, your thoughts on what has happened economically and financially? The decisions take. Use this one. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think I would uh, respond to your question, but before then I would uh, like to tie in a brief explanation on three key points you mentioned, especially the finance minister talked about the uh, difference between the minimum capital requirement and also what is happening. Yes. And so you ask a question yeah. to that. Yes. That is very true. The minimum capital required, the new one is about 400 million. Now, if you look at the challenges in some of the banks, the sums or the quantum of money uh, is just beyond the 400 million we're talking about. In the case of uh, Unibank, for example, it has a capital deficit of about 7.4 billion Ghana cities. You know, and so if you look at the fact that the minimum capital required in Unibank is just 400 million, and it has a capital deficit of 7.4 billion Ghana cities, then the minimum capital required in this case, the deficit is about 18.5 times the amount. In percentage terms, that is 1,850 percent. You know, so. If it were to the minimum capital, they would have easily met it. That is what he meant by there's a difference between the minimum capital required and also what is happening now. It is a matter of pure mismanagement, and that is exactly the difference between uh, the two in this particular situation. These, uh, second one, talking about making honest uh, mistakes. Uh, what it basically, if I actually understood this submission, it means there is no, there's no room for witch hunting. It's a matter of ensuring that uh, the due process is followed and justice is served. But in the course of doing that, if the state should err or falter, then it is not deliberate. But then it could be a genuine mistake which could be pardoned. And then the last one, he talked about about 50,000 jobs to be lost, to be lost through the uh, current impasse between August last year and this year. And that is very true, but there is a turnaround. There is a way around it. Fortunately for us as a nation, we have quite a number of applications on the desk of the governor for new banks to be opened. Now, these applications were suspended last year for obvious reasons because we had too many investor banks in the system. We had about 35 of them, you know, compared uh, with Nigeria, which has only about 25, and we had struggling banks. So there was the need to suspend the uh, issuance of licenses and ensure that those those within the system are able to stand on their feet before new ones are introduced. Now that we are streamlining the system, 
will be able to know exactly the number of banks that will survive in terms of universal banks and this will create the opportunity for new licenses to be issued now the new banks will be able to tap into the experience of those who will be laid off through this situation so there will be a revolving effect and these job losses are likely to be eroded or taken out through the issuance of new licenses somewhere by the end of the year or nested thereabouts. So I don't think mm. yeah. uh, we have to raise strong alarms with okay. regards to the job situation. Under the current si situation, it would. But the situation yeah. can I, I, be corrected. I need to make a quick correction, though. The yeah. finance minister did not say that 50,000 jobs will be lost. He said that they are affected. No, he said that it's a 50,000 strong sector. This is my understanding. No, no, no. It's jobs. Unless you said, unless I'm hearing yeah, jobs. Wrong. We're talking about. Did you say jobs. that fifty thousand jobs? Will, These seven banks. No, he didn't say that. You know, so he said that he said that the the the, the sector yeah, employs affected. together fifty thousand oh, okay. people. Okay. For okay. because of course the, even the largest bank, okay, Unibank, okay. if you take permanent staff, yeah. it's not up to a thousand. But if you bring in non-permanent, it's thousand eight hundred. If you bring in related companies, it's four thousand. So it would be strange for him to say fifty thousand. And I'm sure he's here. He can correct no. that. Well, so I'm just I'm just giving that as a, a, okay. a, a okay. factual point. Well, then maybe the figure has to do with estimated number of people employed in the financial sector. Yes, in the sector. financial sector, yes. Okay. Who might said. be invariably affected yes, because the, there will be a trickle-down effect yes. uh, from these seven banks. And that is very true. What number, uh, whatever number is affected mm -hmm. obviously will be reabsorbed into the financial subsector through some of these right. initiatives. The issuance of new licenses will have Fantastic. to do that. Now I'm back to your so question. You have to answer my questions too. No, I'm not coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> now you talked about the government coming in to bail out the first two banks, the UT Bank and Capital Bank. I think in my uh, first submission I did state that the responsibility of the nation through the central bank is to ensure that the economy keeps revolving you know, and it does not get stagnant in the process. And as a result, you must always come in uh, with a form of bailout where necessary so that there will be stimulation in the economy. What happened in the case of UT Bank and Capital Bank, as I've indicated or illustrated somewhere, I could repeat here, it's just a matter of a mother with several children, the older ones trying to bully the younger ones. Ones. Now, before the younger ones who are uh, numeratively uh, more than the older ones could run to the mother to cry that we have been bullied, the mother could quickly come in and address the situation with the younger ones and later turn to the older ones to find out why they behaved the way they did. So the government's intervention with that $2.2 billion uh, was intended to ensure that the excesses of the operations of capital and UTA bank will not be adversely felt by their depositors or customers, but then the operations would continue while the government resort to the owners of UT and Capital mm. Bank for explanations as to why their operations degenerated into loss in Karen and not profit deriving in perpetuity. So it was very, very important. And this is the reason why we are still not hearing any negatives with regards to the customers of UT Bank and Capital Bank that have been absorbed into okay. the GCB. So All that right. is why it is Thank very, you. very important. And when we come to the second one, uh, the the five consolidated banks. Yeah, I wanted uh, Osei Sibri to, uh, okay. to, to tackle that. Uh, Thank you. So, so that was um, um, Dr. Ebenezer. Actually, I'll take comments from Osei Sibri. Yes, same on the same question. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, I. the response of the central bank, um, is this something that is good or not? Um, if you look at the banking sector across the globe, what is really happening or what is happening Ghana today is not unprecedented. It's happened before in several other countries. Uh, the recent one was the global financial crisis that happened in the United States. And uh, we all saw the response of the Federal Reserve, uh, what it did. So in many cases, the most important thing will be what the central bank does after the crisis, because the crisis are often bound to happen. That is why when you look at the when you look at the key functions of the central bank, uh, we have the supervisory role, the regulatory role, being the bank of uh, for the government, the banker of banks, and all of that. The last one is often being the lender of last resort. 
and there is reason for that being put at the last because the framers of such legislation anticipate that there could be crisis one day and when that crisis comes the central bank must be able to position itself to forestall any crisis so the lender of last resort of the central bank is essentially to forestall banks from failing and to ensure the stability and the soundness of the banking sector and that is like i said in the united states the central bank they were there they also had regulations and all of that yet the banking sector ran into difficulty today we are parting the federal reserve for the actions that it took to restore stability in the banking sector so for me what the central bank has done thus far is crucial it is very important to making sure that the crisis did not have the contagion effect to lead to economic crisis because there is now a very semblance of it could easily happen if you look at what is happening now since the non-performing loans uh, ratio started going up you see that there's huge decline in credit growth now credit growth 2014 was 50 percent today as we speak it's around 12.8 percent that is dangerous for the economy and this could have a vicious cycle because once you don't have enough credit expansion you are not going to have uh, banks uh, making enough profit and that means that the banks cannot clean their books and they also become uh, credit credit apprehensive the economy is not going to grow because there's not going to be enough flow of credit into the economy and the banking sector balance sheet begins to deteriorate further and further and that alone mm. in itself can trigger crisis so let me just so let me just get something so you're saying that what has happened is preventing the financial crisis from becoming an economic crisis exactly. which is much deeper than a financial which is crisis much deeper from the yes so for any central bank worth its salt, what it has to do is to have a bailout policy immediately some of the banks may not be able to be rescued the, fin the central bank is the financial rescuer but some of them depending upon the degree to which their asset has deteriorated yeah. there's no way the central bank can but if this, those banks are allowed to stay they it can trigger contagion effect on the other banks so the best policy will be to let those banks go immediately and find tighten deposited fund there are others that can have liquidity support for them to stay afloat and that the central bank must be able to immediately identify to support them liquidity wise and the government also have a role safety nets to also support such banks because the danger is fine we may lose or some people may lose some jobs in the process but look at the bigger picture in the event that the central bank is not able to bring sanity to the system and this thing gets out of hand we're going to have the entire financial system breaking down and mm -hmm. the job loss is going to be much bigger and in fact once the financial sector breaks down your entire economy okay. cannot stay on its face so the liquidity support is crucial great it's i i, I want to for that safety thank you for that i'm sorry i'm cutting i want to get a comment from the finance minister on some of the points raised on the finance side then i can move to the legal side because i'm trying to keep the discussion flowing so if you can hand your mic to him or okay he's coming up fantastic so i think ken has realized that if he doesn't come things will spoil so he's coming to <laughs> so you take and correct the things quickly no thank you very much i'm i'm going to i'm rushed to have a meeting on banking of the ag and co so uh, I, I need I need to go, but really to thank DI for 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 this platform, and and for the the richness of the conversation, and that we are having. So I think really what um, um, Charles, uh, my colleague, Deputy Minister, was saying, was was the beginning of of us having conversations about these issues, you know, so that there's going to be a little bit more of honesty as we look at each other's eye and say, you know, is this going right? And that's what it is. As we leave the IMF program, um, the issue of whether we can replace it 
of our own sort of social partnership um, agreement uh, in which these conversations are robust, you know, freewheeling, and, uh, and we can really enforce the laws and use institutions as, as they are. But um, as um, Ace and Charles mentioned, I'm really very comfortable and confident um, with the new management of the central bank. And that is really key. Um, and so we, we, should, we should hold them up and applaud them. And in that same vein, as I mentioned, uh, my letter is going out to them, you know, ensuring that, you know, they go through the whole process, uh, which they've started already, of the restructuring, of, of, of finding out um, who opened the, the floodgates and what they did uh, with liquidity support, routing it through other institutions, knowing where it was going, etc., cetera, um, so that never again, and will the Bank of Ghana be in the middle um, of such of, of, of such a disgrace? Um, in, in the end, um, I think we have essentially um, stopped the potential contagion um, from the finance into an economic crisis, and I think people should be confident about that. Um, President was very clear uh, about where deposits are stood, and his key thing when we are always bring an economic policy is leave the little people alone, okay? And, and it's a constant theme um, that he has, and that, that reinforces the direction in, in which uh, we are going. Um, as, as I look um, forward to, to this opportunity, um, is that, well, what do you need? Do we need, Canada has five banks, Nigeria has 25, do we need 34? And, and, and we don't. But do we need Ghanaians to participate in the financial industry? We do, you know. But what type of Ghanaian should be in the financial industry? And that is a fit and proper test uh, that has to come through. So uh, as, as we envision it right now from, from, from the ministry, um, we, we are expecting um, that Consolidated Development Bank, um, Consolidated Bank w would become, you know, sort of equivalent to GCB grow stronger um, with it, and, and that will be that. Um, I think there are a whole bunch of indigenous banks, about five, six of them, who have begun discussions on measure so that by the end of the year they can meet that. And we need to find a way um, to support that so they can maybe potentially concentrate um, on sort of a SME financing, which is key um, to our development. Uh, and that's what creates a vibrancy in the economy. Um, then I did mention um, that we're looking at uh, NIB, um, ADB coming together. Um, I think we are still on that course um, to do that because at the core of that will then be creating, you know, that um, capacity um, to look at this whole industrialization, 1D, 1F, in an organized and structured way with a strong institution that does that. So aggregate industrialization would be taking off. Um, then, of course, I have um, what I call GESL, uh, which was to create a guarantee system to be able to support agric. Um, we may have to, um, to look at that uh, and see whether that can also be even further strengthened um, so that we have another um, development bank that, you know, moves us forward beyond, you know, the small industries that, that we'll be able to do. Um, so with that, you're you sort of cleaning uh, the system and, and creating a robust chassis um, for the transformation that, that we envision. Um, so as long as we go ahead um, to clean up and to prosecute so that it doesn't happen again, it's really an opportunity um, to build that framework um, for sustained growth um, that we are looking for. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, contagion um, towards a crisis, uh, economic crisis has been eliminated. We're confident about that. Um, we are looking, as you can see, to ensure that depositors' funds are safe, uh, and we are going to do that. But even with that, you know, the sophisticated investor um, who took his money to a bank that he knew um, could not uh, bring it back to them. And the corporate governance in the institution, as long as they are government-related, they will be made to, to look at those things too. So nobody is going to get out of the net. And we have to be careful and meticulous about it because you don't want to lose um, through some, you know, sort of court proceedings and then you miss all of that. 
but the commitment um, is clear. Um, making sure deposits of money are safe is clear. Our confidence in the new management of the banking system um, is also there. But the, the other excitement is now that the public's care um, and interest in that, um, because that keeps everybody on their toes, and, and you also become a lot more discerning uh, in where you take your money. Um, so thank you again, and really appreciate all of this. Thank you, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata. So we want to take a final comment from the panel, and I'll open the floor for questions. And even if Ken leaves, Charles will be here to answer questions as it may pertain. Do I, can I see by hand if there are any questions in the house? So it gives me a, a sense of what to do. Okay. So there are a couple of questions. So uh, thank you. But you said something that you were going to meet the Attorney General on financial issues. So I don't know whether that means that you are going to discuss prosecutions, but we will send an ambassador to follow you on your way out. Let me take two comments from the law people and then I'll take questions from the floor. So, Clara and Ace, you've seen the 27-point plan of the Operation Eagle project, and you've heard some of the things I've read out. There's something they call a cooling-off period. If you've worked in the central bank for two years, you can't be a director in a bank. Anybody involved in this for the next five years, you can't do anything in the financial institution. They've set up committees in the central bank. They are going to treat uh, liquidity support differently. Clara first. Are these the kinds of things you want to see when you were speaking first? The kinds of things legally, changes within the BOG's own system. Is this the kind of thing you wanted to see? Please, there's a mic in front of you near is Use that mic. So I want your comment on some of the steps the BOG has put in place. Okay. Um, Bernard, this is a difficult one. Because for me, fundamentally, as I have said, is that I am not really interested in this is what I'm, I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. I've, as a Ghanaian, I've had enough of that. To the extent that now when I hear a lot, I am not necessarily impressed, forgive me. What I want to see is action. That's all I want to see. I want to see the various, I've always said that, no matter what law we, we have that we think is not sufficient, enforce that law. Then when you have completed enforcing that law and you think that, okay, I think I could do better with this, 